Yeah, and thank you, Claire. For the, I want to echo my colleagues. Thanks for your um, editorial bene 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 sorry, benevolence and beneficence, I think, and patience, and for the invitation to come and talk about one of my favorite topics, clinical ethics. It's a tiny little deviation from the program title, and it'll become evident why. This is a, a quotation from ethicist Howard Brody, uh, a US ethicist, and he's referring to research ethics committees. And he's saying that if they were a drug, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't get ethical approval. And I think it might, my suspicion is it might apply to clinical ethics committees as well. But we'll just see what you think about that. So this is my plan. Um, I'm going to very quickly discuss what they are, what they do. These clinic, I'm going to talk about clinical ethics support services, not clinical ethics committees as such, because clinical ethics support can be provided by individuals, by small groups, or by larger committees. So to call it a committee doesn't adequately encompass the range of um, forms that this service can take. And then I'd ha like to have a little look at the, the need for, uh, what, really at the question of why or whether there is a need for explicit attention to ethics within clinical governance structures. Because clinical governance, if you read the blurbs, sounds like it's talking about ethics between the lines. But the word ethics isn't mentioned in the sort of definition of clinical governance, and I'm wondering of course, ethics plays a part in how clinical, go clinical governance is um, enacted and considered, but I'm wondering, do we need explicit attention to ethics? Do we need a form of ethical governance in there as well? Have a, I'm going to have a very quick look at the barriers to these services based on some of the empirical literature, and then I'll pop in a tiny bit about their credibility and the nature of the expertise that these, what these committees have to offer and the nature of the expertise that they have. I use the word expertise advisedly because there's been a huge problematization in the literature on this area about the idea of the ethics expert. What have they got expertise in? And um, how does that actually help clinicians in any way? And you know what, that's a very, very fair question. So clinical ethics, really, this is the canonical definition from Johnson, Ziegler, and Winslade. It's a practical discipline which provides a structured approach by identifying, analyzing, and resolving ethical issues in clinical practice. Now, I just realized, I forgot to take the time, but I'm talking for about five minutes, aren't I already? I got this giant watch so that I can tell the time is passing and then I never look at it. So I'm gonna try and uh, finish in 20 minutes. So a clinical ethics support service then is a service that's provided either by an individual, that's the kind of Canadian model, or maybe as a, in, the, in a small team format or with a larger committee, which can, is supposed to be able to convene at quite short notice. So you can see that already there's logistical issues there. They offer information, advice, and what I'd like to focus on, decision-making support to healthcare providers um, in relation to any ethically challenging cases that might arise. They also have other functions, which I'll mention in a minute. They can be invited to become involved in case consultation where these cases arise and some support might be or information and that might also be legal information might be need, might be requested by clinicians but they be, become in, involved really only by invitation and ideally this is documented and there's a formal process in place and when i say formal i mean a, a process that's structured in some way and recognized as legitimate by the institution, which um, is responsible for setting up the service. So in addition to consultation, they also provide in-house education on issues that are considered um, important. And these, you know, how, whether or not an issue is considered important or whether or not staff uh, see the need for an educational in-service depends on um, the, the, the perspectives of the staff and the issues that arise. So sometimes an issue might keep arising in patient care and then it, it, that indicates that there's a need for some kind of um, education around that issue. Um, for instance, new laws require educational in initiatives and sustained educational initiatives in order that practitioners may understand better their nuances. But the function, and I really need to stress this, is that this isn't designed as a form of policing. It's not a form of regulation, it's support. The idea is that these services help to streamline practice. They emerge in response to the needs of health professionals, families and patients, and I should come clean and say largely in response to the needs of health professionals for support in addressing these ethical issues, these ethical issues arising in, in challenging cases. And sometimes in everyday cases as well, and I should also say, unlike sort of medical ethics proper, clinical ethics isn't an academic endeavor. It takes place within the hospital setting, on the wards, in the, 
you know the places where doctors and nurses and allied health professionals are. But the focus is on a systematic, generally what in the literature the focus is on a systematic approach to collecting and analysing data information um, and a very inclusive, fair and transparent decision making process. And the idea is that you know at some level this is providing a space for people to examine the sort of assumptions underlying their practice, maybe the value systems that they have and often this opportunity is only provided when a conflict becomes apparent and in many cases it becomes um, necessary only when a crisis point is reached. There's a very, the Veterans Association, the Veterans Administration in the US have a very nice idea of preventative ethics. So you educate in order to prevent conflict from arising in the first place. It's a very nice proactive approach. You don't react to conflict um, when it's already arisen because that stymies your, your efforts to resolve it in many ways. And this process involves a weighing up of options and a balanced consideration of alternatives. I know I do have long-winded slides and I do apologize for that, but this is the best I can do. I'm usually much worse. So the goals of clinical, I am, the goals of clinical ethics support services then, the for, foremost goal is to um, improve the process of care provision and the outcomes of patient care. Through this um, analysis, and this is something that happens in parallel to um, clinical governance, by identifying, analyzing, and resolving ethical problems where they arrive. And that, so these are several, uh, I suppose, suggestions. So there's no consensus actually what this service might look like, or what its goals are, or what its nature is. There's, a, there's a, quite a degree of variability across the, say, um, institutions, I suppose, and jurisdictions that would provide such services. I'm talking mostly about North America, Canada. I'll show you the prevalence slide in a minute. <laughs> Makes it sound like a disease, but it isn't actually a disease. I think I'm so funny. Anyway, so <laughs> the, the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities have been championing uh, the call for a credentialing process for clinic, uh, sort of credentialing process for the recognition of clinical ethics as a uh, as a discipline within healthcare, as a subdiscipline within within healthcare. And I know that makes people's hair stand on end in some section, sectors, but you know that's that's what they're doing, and they've been devoted to it now for quite some time. But they believe that the conflict in healthcare relates really to value uncertainty um, or conflicting value systems. That's the essence of this conflict that we're talking about and that's what defines many of these ethical challenging cases. Um, so they want to look at how we can improve healthcare pro providers' abilities or help healthcare providers to address these sort of uncertainties, these value conflicts, and to identify them in the first place. Um, Fletcher and Siegler, way back in 96, um, talked about a fair inclusive decision-making process, and that's also really central to this notion of decision-making support. The, the focus is on who gets to be involved in the decision, what, to what extent is their voice heard, what role do they have in the decision-making process, and even clarifying those, uh, giving clear answers to those questions sometimes goes a long way towards resolving um, um, disputed issues. They also aim to improve ethically competent, ethically competent decision making in healthcare. That follows from the above points, and to be a, to develop an ability, foster the ability to identify and support ethically appropriate decision makers. Now, that's that's quite a normative claim, and you know there's got a little bit of um, justification required for that. But there are uh, that goes back to the idea of who has a voice in the decision making process, and who's not. You know, it, we need to be able to identify. Where there's a gap in the in the in, around the table in terms of who is who has a role in the decision making process. Nancy Dubler talks about forging consensus. She's coming from an uh, uh, she's coming from a position where she believes that or she defines ethics consultation, this decision making support as oh, did I do that? As um, the, she de she defines it. She sees it more like mediation, and she talks about forging consensus. And I understand and acknowledge that it is not possible in many of these kind of cases to emerge at the other end of a sort of a facilitative discussion with a consensus. Um, but the goal is there to forge consensus. And sometimes these bodies, these um, support services are required to offer a recommendation. The approach is practical, systematic, structured, multidisciplinary. So a committee would have um, a, a plethora of different disciplines within it. And ideally they're non-hierarchical. So if there's somebody from administration, their voice has the same um, impact, I suppose, or is supposed to have the same impact, or suppose they're supposed to have the same um, 
sort of role in decision making as a senior consultant. Now that's very hard for many um, critics of this process to swallow. It's a very blue skies kind of idea that the, the hierarchy needs to be abolished altogether. They're supposed to be impartial, they're supposed to be inclusive, they're supposed to be solution or consensus focused. And we talk about ethics facilitation as aiming towards that goal. They're geared towards fostering communication and promoting learning and not towards oversight or policing, as I said. They've got to be supported from the top down and integrated at some level through the organisation. And the literature shows that the committees which do receive this kind of support are the most the, the best functioning. If they don't have the support from the top down, you know, it's just kind of ethics washing, really, let's face it. They're slow burning. They may take 10, 5, 10, 15 years to build to, so that they have it, so that their role is recognized in the institution. So is there a need for them? Who would require this support? Maybe multidisciplinary teams seeking information in relation to the ethical dimension of a particular clinical case. And I'm talking specifically, specifically about ethics, not about law. These committees can, sometimes they have a legal representative sitting on a committee, um, or else if there's an individual ethicist or a small team, they can call on the hospital's legal advisor to help them, or seek um, other types of legal advice. But staff members who, who perceive a conflict or an emotionally difficult issue may, may consult these bodies these services, or if they feel that an issue in the past wasn't successfully resolved, they can request a kind of a debrief. There's all these, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different functions that these committees can, can play, can um, perform. Um, sometimes there's a need for a particular policy direction to be taken, and a staff member may request that. And I'm talking, these are all referring to a, an organization in which a committee or a support service has gained some traction. You know, they, they obviously they have to gain the trust of the staff in the institution in which they're, they're set up, and that can take a long time. And at the very bottom of the list, we have patients, because historically patients aren't the ones who um, come to an ethics support service for help. It's usually staff members who do that. Most patients don't even know they exist. That said, a lot of staff members don't know they exist. Unless they're publicized in the organization and endorsed by management, it doesn't um, you know, it doesn't filter down to the people who might need it. So that all of these kind of issues are issues which come up again and again for clinical ethics support services. So, you know, capacity and consent, um, decision making in relation to patients who lack capacity. I'm not going to them all out over treatment, under treatment, withdrawal of treatment. Um, increasingly, there's uh, certainly in the States and Canada, there's issues around insurance and uninsured patients requiring expensive treatments um, uh, um, at a cost to the hospital itself. Discharge planning is a really big issue now in clinical ethics. I just put these examples, so these were examples that I encountered in my training, so I'm trying, like, personalizing it a little bit, but, you know, we had a 12-year-old whose mother insisted that they weren't, they didn't receive a da an athlete in training for the Olympic, uh, the Olympic Games. The mother insisted that she didn't get her diagnosis of paraplegia. A wife who continued to feed her husband, very domineering wife, um, leading to repeated aspiration, episodes of aspiration. Um, a non-paternity case. This was all just within a couple of months. <coughs> uh, parents of a baby with a life-limiting condition who refused to take the baby home from hospital for the, m the, the month that it had to live. Um, a baby that was found, a baby's body that had been delivered stillborn and was found in a plastic bag in the morgue. So they, the baby's clothes went to the funeral and the baby went into a plastic bag by accident. Um, a lady who refused to discuss weaning from a ventilator even though she had capacity but she wouldn't communicate. Um, people with misdiagnoses or to date diagnoses that came too late, you know, to enable them to survive. So those kind of issues. 81% 80, of hospitals in the U.S. have some clinical ethics support provision. Higher again in Canada. Um, there's about 82 clinical ethics committees in the U.K. Now there may be more or less than that. I suspect that there's more. That was a statistic from 2010. There's 24 clinical ethics committees in Norway. Germany's not doing too well here. Only 31% of hospitals have an ethics committee, and often that's a that's related to a sort of a, a hospital with a sort of a religious, more religious ethos. 89% of hospitals in the Netherlands have an ethics committee. All general and psychiatric <coughs> hospitals in Belgium have some kind of um, ethics support service, and in France, all hospitals have an ethical space. Now that's a little bit vague, I admit. Why the prevalence? This is driven by accreditation, or it's seen to be driven by accreditation in the jurisdictions in which hospitals are accredited hospitals are required to have some uh, provision 
for the discussion of ethical issues some mechanism for dealing with ethical issues there is an increasing recognition that clinical decisions have an ethical dimension and that healthcare organizations need some kind of resource for dealing with this um, and again as i said the need only becomes explicit in many cases when we've reached crisis point when the disagreement has arisen and when the values are already in conflict or when the potential for litigation becomes apparent so you can see how a, a, an idea of ethics support um, defined as mediation might be more acceptable to some organizations um, again as we've just been discussing all day the ethical standards that are issued by the regulatory bodies are becoming more demanding and there's an onus on health professionals to comply with these standards throughout their careers and to keep up with these standards as they evolve and that's quite onerous and obviously education is required in relation to those develop the developments in the uh, or the evolution I suppose in the standards produced by the regulatory bodies and again finally it's seen as one way having this kind of mechanism is seen as a way of addressing the demand for greater um, public accountability in healthcare. So these are the questions that the Joint Commission were asking when they got to Ireland. Now I don't have documentary evidence of this but I have it really from somebody who has very good authority to pass, pass these questions on. So although it's not a requirement in Ireland to, for other hospitals to have a mechanism in place to address complex ethical issues, the JCI wanted to know, um, they wanted the private hospitals in Ireland to tell them what kind of mechanisms um, they had in place to deal with clinical ethics issues, what their members, who were their members, how the code of ethics for the hospital was developed, how the hospital addressed ethical issues, what procedure is in place for staff to bring an ethics, if an ethical issue to the committee, uh, what kinds of issues they had dealt with, what education the committee do the committee members receive or did they receive, and what ethical education do the staff at the hospital receive. So this is pretty pertinent. This is this was only. Um, I think two years ago that they came on their last holiday to Ireland and they were asking those questions then. Now that said, um, there's quite a lot of variability I mentioned earlier in the uh, range of models of clinical ethics support where they <laughs> exist. And there's a huge, and this reflects I suppose the var var variance in the institutional and political context in which these services would be developed. So you know some institutions would would tick a box and say they have an ethics committee but it's not transparent it's not accessible to staff it's not really accountable in any way and that's problematic even in jurisdictions where these these kind of um, services are required now there's a huge problem with the I suppose again the variance when it comes to defining what clinical ethics consultation actually involves and what its aim is so I did a bit of research with clinical ethicists and they many of them didn't agree on what the role of the committee or the service was so some felt that it was um, absolutely vital that they when upon assessment of the issue that was presented to them that the committee or the service provided an answer they provided some kind of resolution or they provided some kind of recommendation for action and these were in big transplant hospitals these ethicists were saying to me, you, nobody comes to the committee to be told, oh, you know, well, we, you know, we'll give you a chance to reflect on these issues. They come to the committee because they want an answer to a specific question that they've asked. So that would be quite a, a, an onerous requirement to expect a committee to be directed in this way. Most of these services, committees are otherwise, have a non-direct, non-directive function, a merely advisory function, sorry, uh, whereby they are just as I said, they're creating a space for discussion, creating a, res a reflective space where providers can uh, get in a room together and actually articulate their respective positions in, re in relation to a particular case. And sometimes that's sufficient to uh, promote a resolution a little bit further down the line. Now, there are loads of barriers, as you can imagine, to the provision of or the, the establishment of these services. I know this is a very long-winded slide, but I wanted to put them all there so that you could kind of get an overview. So clinical users, there's barriers that are associated with actually the healthcare professionals that would use these services. There's barriers associated with patients and patients' rights organizations. There's barriers that would be articulated by hospital management and there's barriers 
that uh, the, the main barrier in relation to the public is that the public doesn't really know what ethics consultation is or what an ethics support service is or why it's needed. But a lot of members of the public don't know what their rights are in healthcare either, so that's not hugely surprising. But the clinical, the, the clinical professionals that would use or that would be um, the sort of target market for clinical ethics support services, um, when asked in a variety of different uh, interviews there that I've mentioned on the side, so many clinicians feel that they're already ethically competent. It's just part of what they do. I'll show you another slide with some quotations in a minute. Some clinicians felt that there is no need for the intrusion of experts intoxicated with medical power, that actually discussions on the corridor or over a cup of coffee with your colleagues are much more beneficial to resolving issues that are troubling you. A um, little bit ad hoc that, but you know, obviously it's historically, there's a historical precedent there. Um, there's a perception that communication and patient outcomes are matters for which doctors are responsible. And to argue otherwise is to kind of hand over your responsibility. That's also associated with a fear of repercussion. So if you don't take responsibility, if you abrogate responsibility in some way for an outcome, that you will be liable, just as we were talking about a minute ago. Many clinicians don't have any knowledge of, or prior knowledge of, or any ex experience of um, having interacted with the service. They don't know what that service can do, so they would be reluctant to entrust members of that service with the sort of task at hand, especially in situations of uncertainty. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about what level of authority and expertise the staff, the members of the, the clinical ethics support service actually possess. And of course there's fears about interference an external party interfering with patient care. In terms of the objections that patients and patient or patient organisations in particular would put forward, there's little demonstrated evidence of benefit to patients. There just isn't enough evidence on the efficacy of these um, support services at all. There's very little, comparatively little empirical data in existence. And if it's hard to quantify actually what one of the what a, a service like this would be able to achieve, say, in a given year, because you, your achievement might be, the achievements might not be measurable, the achievement might constitute the prevention of conflict or the prevention of crisis, but how do you actually monitor or measure that? From a management point of view, oh yeah, so other patient groups or patients felt that um, there was a possibility of co-option of this service by medical or institutional interest. That there could actually be a conflict of interest between a clinical ethics committee and um, four members of the clinical ethics committee or clinical ethics services where they're being paid by the organization or the institution, but then they feel that they, they have to advocate a recommendation, perhaps, that is at odds with the priorities of the institution. Can you, so you could see the, po the possibility for compromise and conflict of interest there. From a hospital management point of view, they're definitely not resource noodle, no, sorry, what's re resource noodle, resource neutral. Um, so, you know, that is a major consideration in these cash strap times. Hospitals may feel that there are many better ways that they could be spending their money. They may be right. I love this quotation. I had to put it in in its entirety. So this is one of the doctors um, <laughs> interviewed by Alice Godin and her colleagues in uh, Quebec. <coughs> I'll just read it out for people who can't see it. So the doctor said, one of my problems with the ethics committee, it seems to me that everybody, all the parties, their opinions are given equal weight. For some people's opinions are just wrong. They're inherently wrong or scientifically wrong. Yet it seems like everybody gets to have the same opinion. That's the like, non-hierarchical nature of the service. A bit like if you're on a boat sailing across the ocean and two of the crew announced they believed the earth was flat. I put it up in the picture up there. And if we sailed past wherever, we'd go off the edge and they feel they should have an equal say in how the boat is operated. So the underlying premise, strongly held premise, is that is inherently wrong. And there's a powerful view <laughs> expressed there. It kind of speaks for itself. But then John Lantos, who I really admire, did say in his discussion of the Ashley treatment, uh, when he discussed the mistakes that the Ethics Committee made in um, advocating you might know the case, but I'm not going to discuss it now, advocating sterilization for a profoundly disabled um, seven-year-old girl. He said, ethics committees, so this, she said, this decision requires openness, transparency, and procedural fairness. And then he proceeded to say at the end of the same paragraph, ethics committees are not open, transparent, or procedurally fair. And I think it's a little bit, he didn't give a justification for that point. He might have been talking about a single ethics committee, but I don't think he can tar every single clinical ethics support service with the same brush. That's just, uh, but that's an issue I'll take with him again. 
there are some reported benefits. Improved communication, more transparent process, more opportunities for fu fruitful collaboration between um, disciplines and perhaps between professionals and patients. Enhanced decision making for definite exposure to alternative viewpoints. I don't want to put this too strongly because there's, again, as I said, there's a real dearth of empirical evidence out there. But this is a study car uh, carried out by Carolyn Johnson, who's doing great work over in King's College London. Professionals can be reassured. They might go to this service just to be reassured at the other end that they've done the right thing. They've had the, liberty, the opportunity to talk through the issue, which has already, I suppose, been resolved maybe in one way or another with this service, members of this service, and they get reassurance at the end of it. There, bless you, there is an opportunity for specialty specific capacity building here, certainly in relation to the educational function that these committees um, perform. There are benefits to hospital management. You can, so we talked a little bit, somebody mentioned organisational efforts, Ruth, it was you, well, not organisational efforts as such, but these can contribute over time to the development of what's called an ethical climate within the organisation. Um, they can produce a, provide a space for deliberation and, um, and, dis and discussion and reflection. They may reduce liability, no evidence for that. They may reduce staff, bur staff burnout. They may ultimately lead to improved um, reports of patient satisfaction. Lawrence Schneiderman has done a couple of studies which indicate that there's a correlation between ethics consultations and reduction in bed days for very sick ICU patients. This is, these are ways, this is an old article from 1996, with very little data there on what patients think. I'm going to finish in two minutes, I'm really sorry about this. Um, patients have um, reported that they, their understanding of the clinical situation and their ability to sort of weigh up options in the decision making process in, increased as a result of this, this opportunity to, to, to discuss the issue with, um, with, with some support service or committee members. Did I miss the end of that sentence? They, they also reported increased legal clarity and increased moral clarity. I think this is an interesting one. There could be a lot more to say about this, but I'm just putting it up there now. Um, they believed that um, sometimes a difficult judgment was endorsed by the committee or by the support service, so maybe the, such, such as the decision to withdraw treatment, for instance. They felt the decision-making process was made easier or facilitated better by these by this service. Um, they felt more empowered. They made it. They found that it was easier to implement a decision. They found greater clarity in terms of interpreting technical language, um, greater clarity in terms of cross-cultural communication, and they also received consolation and support. And Schneiderman, it's the same Schneiderman, talks about the difficulty of actually pinpointing all the factors that would contribute to an acceptable and satisfactory resolution in very complex cases, um, if that is possible at all in those kind of cases. And he said, well, we, look, we can't really define these factors, but our best hope is to be able to identify and avoid, avoid obstructive ingredients that interfere with the chances of the success of the process. I, I might finish with this slide because I know time is running out. And I've got one or two more um, about credibility. That might come up in the questions. Um, but these are, this is a 2015 article from the Medical Journal of Australia. And um, these are quotations. Th these just represent the variety of perceptions of clinical ethics services. So doctors, are, the, the, I think most of these people are doctors. So the first one says, look, I guess it's about whether or not it's real woven into your culture. Your people are maybe not talking about ethics. They're not labeling it as such or bringing it up as such, but it's there under the surface all the time. So the question is, is there a need for explicit attention to these issues? Is there a need for this kind of analysis? Is there a need to label it? Um, another doctor says a lot of times we're practicing, we don't verbalize it, um, yet it's all about ethics and all those things, but we don't verbalize it, but we are practicing it. Same question arises. And then one person said it was really valuable, it would be really valuable for them to have a formal ethics committee to have, and I thought this was interesting, to have all the lead up preliminary discussions, that's the reflective space, where people are prompted into thinking more deeply. Okay, it may be a luxury, but some people feel it's necessary. Um, one doctor said, I don't think there's anything 
there's been anything where I ever thought we could have needed some ethical support. I think we're pretty good on that. And another one says it's hard to know what role they can actually have and how can an ethics committee help. So this reflects the diversity of views among clinicians on what is actually, um, what these, what role these, these bodies can actually play. That's just a little mention of the RCTs conducted by, um, he actually conducted randomised controls, Schneiderman did. So 80% of staff and families in these ICU, of these ICU patients found the consultations helpful. And they did seem to be correlated, ethics consultations seem to be correlated with um, the resolution of conflicts that led to um, reduction in, in appropriately prolonging life. But again, obtaining quantitative evidence or of their efficacy is very difficult. Some people emphasise over everything else the educational function of the uh, the educational function of the clinical ethics service, and they say actually what's really important forget not forget about consultation, but I mean that takes a secondary role. Actually, the top priority is education for clinicians to broaden their ethical perspectives and practice skills in participating in shared decision making, and actually. Clinicians need this. What they don't know is need is somebody telling them what to do. They're the primary moral problem solvers in the, the, the clinical context, and this has to be respected by ethics cons, cons, consultations. So that's kind of a, a, a view that's at odds with the view that you, a clinician goes to an ethics consult, consultation and gets an answer. So are they, is it promoting due diligence in decision making, or is it undue interference in clinical decision making? That's the question I have on my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope I didn't go too much.